Thank you. So your handy if this thing doesn't work, somebody? Sure. <laughs> I will not miss your papers. <laughs> yeah, you take that with you. I'm in trouble. Yeah. Are you okay if we start two minutes early? Yes, that'd be lovely. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for Women in Politics. No, you're not in the wrong room. That one's across the way. Joining us today for Earn a Power Play with Regional Cooperation. I'm Darren Hill. I am a city councillor in Saskatoon and a SUMA uh, director on the board. I'm also joined by my colleague, uh, Councillor Randy Donauer from Saskatoon. We welcome you to the city for the SUMA convention. He will be acting as bouncer today if it gets a little rowdy in here. Now, before we get the session started, I want to quickly note uh, the safety information can be found on page 25 of your Convention 2019 handbook. Not the one from last year, this one, 2019, page 25. You're going to get tired of hearing about the safety information on that page. Every session is going to tell you that because we take safety very seriously here and we want to ensure that you are having the best time at convention but you're doing it safely. So page 25, you will hear that again. Now, note that the session is being recorded. So when we open up for question and answer period, I do need you to come to the mic so that the questions can be captured on the audio recording and then they will be played or you can download them or live uh, stream them off of the website. 
So people need to know what your questions are as to what the uh, panelists are answering. Now, um, it's my pleasure to introduce our four presenters. We have got uh, Judy Harwood, right to my right, is the Reeve of the RM of Corman Park and a director for the Saskatchewan Association of Rural Municipal Municipalities. Judy previously represented Corman Park as a councillor for two terms and is a recipient of the Golden Jubilee Medal for Community Service. Next to uh, Judy, we have Mayor Kent Munch, Mayor of the City of Martinsville. His worship first entered municipal politics after moving to Martinsville in 2001 and has since served three terms as city councillor and two as mayor. His current focuses are regional growth and efficiency to ensure the residents have access to a variety of services and employments. Next to him is Dennis Helmuth, is currently in his second term as, oh, no, sorry, uh, jumped over chief, so we are still at Dennis on the far end there then. He's currently in his second term as uh, mayor for the town of Rostron. Prior to being mayor, he served as a town councillor beginning in 1997. Wow. And has always advocated the philosophy that what is good for us helps our neighbours, and what is good for our neighbours helps us. And finally, we have Chief Roy Petit of Beardies and Okamasa's Cree Nation. He has been a youth worker and counselor, an employment and training counselor, and the director of three different organizations. He credits cultural teachings and the wisdom of elders and ceremony for providing the guiding light to overcome many of the challenges that he's encountered in life. So for those of you uh, with the SUMA convention app, who's downloaded it already? Raise your hand. Awesome. That number keeps getting higher every year. You can go to the app and find even more detailed uh, biographies of each of our presenters here. So I encourage you after the session to go learn a little bit more about who we have uh, up at the table here today. Now, we are going to ask that you give the speakers your full attention while they're doing the presentation. And we will do, be doing questions after all four speakers have done their presentation. So if you've got a question in your mind for one of the speakers, just make a note of it or write it down on something so you don't forget because we will take as many questions as we can in the time frame. So thank you for joining us today and join me in welcoming our presenters here today. And uh, Reeve Harwood is going to go first. Well, bear with me. This is uh, this might be an experiment. Well, there you go. Well, good afternoon, uh, SUMA executives, special guests, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you uh, for the organizers of the convention for inviting Corman Park to be part of this um, uh, presentation today, and also for letting us share with you our long journey towards completing an amazing project through regional cooperation. To give you a little regional context for our presentation, the RM of Corman Park was established in 1970, following the amalgamation of three smaller rural municipalities. Our current population is close to 9,000, which makes us the most populated RM in the province, almost double of the next one. Corman Park surrounds six urban municipalities, the cities of Saskatoon, Warman and Martinsville, as well as the towns of Osler, Langham and Dalmany. Corman Park includes all the land shown in white, green and pink on the map and the urban municipalities are highlighted as well. The pink area is our Corman Park Saskatoon Planning District where we have joint planning with the city of Saskatoon. The pink and green areas combined represent the P4G regional plan study area. We will speak to both the planning district as well as the P4G during our presentation today. I want to take some time to talk about our current planning district, as it has been the framework for the cooperative planning in our region since 1956, when the first joint bylaw between the City of Saskatoon and the RM was adopted. Since that time, we have formalized into a planning district, which is enabled by the Saskatchewan Provincial Planning and Development Act. Our first jointly adopted official community plan was done in 1983, while the most recent documents were adopted in 2010. 
Within the planning district boundaries, we have a district planning commission or the DPC. The RM and the city each get four voting reps on the DPC with at least one being an elected official. There's also one joint voting member who is chosen between the two municipalities by mutual resolution. With a joint member, we look for them to understand both the RM and the city perspectives. For example, live in the one municipality and perhaps work in the other. Our district planning has two main roles. The first is to develop a development review. The DPC reviews applications to rezone, subdivide, or establish discretionary uses on land. The DPC reviews administrative reports and recommendations on applications prior to the RM Council. Reports typically only go to the RM Council as well. We retain final decision making because all the district lands are in the RM, which is outside city limits. However, the application must be consistent with the district policies and the RM provides referrals to Saskatoon through the process to gain their feedback. In terms of long-range planning, the DPC reviews and provides advice to councils on current planning issues that affect the district. This may include recommendation for amendments to the district bylaws or acting as a steering committee on long-range plans and studies affecting the district. Our planning district continues to function independently of the regional discussions that are currently taking place. This has been very important as some planning districts in Saskatchewan have attempted to disband recently or gone through a series of changes have, that have stalled development in those regions. While the discussions and regulations within the planning district have been complex over the past few years, as we look regionally, we are proud that applications have continued to come forward and we have found a way to continue the dialogues through successful meetings. This map shows our current district future land use map and boundary, which extends approximately one to three miles from Saskatoon limits. The planning district is important to the municipalities as it shows for a framework, as it allows for a framework that, for talking about growth and a way to implement long-term rural and urban growth plans moving forward. In the past, we have matched services to reflect land uses with developments that need light services going to the RM, while developments needing full services going into Saskatoon. This framework can provide a, a stable and predictable development environment for potential investors in the region. However, as we have experienced the demands of our growing provincial economy, we saw pressures for more rural growth areas and services in the planning district, which has caused Saskatoon to reconsider where their priority areas are for urban development. About six years ago, the two municipalities began to wrestle with how the planning district and the broader regional area could begin to fit with, un with one another. Not only did we have development pressures near Saskatoon, we also saw tremendous growth in the smaller urbans, which meant the municipalities needed to take in an integra integrated approach. Oops. The cities of Martinsville and Warman and the town of Osler, all located in Corman Park, north of Saskatoon, have had rapid growth over the past few decades. In fact, Martinsville and Warman, over the last two census periods, were some of the fastest growing cities in Canada. This slide illustrates the growth in built up areas over the past 30 years. In the early 2000s, and continuing over the next decade, it is when we really began to experience a population boom in the region, shown in red, purple and green colors on the map. While there are current policies that provide for referral areas where the RM must refer development and application to the smaller municipalities, it is not a formal planning district and it only covers some land uses. The municipalities have generally had positive discussions regarding fringe growth. However, comments were not always taken into account. The process was okay when they were smaller municipalities, but due to rapid growth pressures, the smaller urbans have tried to do more long-range planning, taking into account rural lands, which are also experiencing growth pressures, which you can see on the map, as many, as, as many of our growth areas are clustered near each other. Because of this, we realized we needed to think more broadly than current referral areas and consider becoming part of a larger planning district. 
Around 2011, this province began to, the province began to ask municipalities to think regionally. Corman Park, Osler, Warman, Martinsville, and Saskatoon received provincial funding to complete a corridor study, focusing on the northern growth corridors along the highways out to the smaller communities. The corridor study gave us an overview of the areas including existing and planned land uses and growth plans, population projections, important transportation networks, and region, regional infrastructure. The infrastructure component included a wastewater management investigation as Martinsville, in Martinsville in particular, is facing capacity issues. We wanted to know what would be required technically and what the cost would be to connect Saskatoon's sewage treatment plant. This is something that Saskatoon does not currently allow, so it would be a major policy change. We wanted to start looking at what is technically feasible and what the costs may be. The study helped us better understand each other's growth plans, growth pressures, and the services and facilities available in the region to help us work together more effectively. It led Saskatoon and Martinsville to sign a memorandum of understanding to explore a sanitary sewer connection further, and the study, and the study recommendations made it clear that we needed to do more formal planning together. In November 2013, the Saskatoon Regional Economic Development Authority, known as SRIDA, hosted a regional growth summit that brought in speakers from across North America with experience in regional planning, servicing, and governance to, to identify best practices and lessons to be learned from one another. The summit organizers produced a set of recommendations that focused on capitalizing on the growing support for more regional type planning. This led to the formalization of the Saskatoon North Partnership for Growth, or P4G as it is called. With that, I will now turn it over to Mayor Mensch to discuss the beginning of our P4G regional plan. Thank you. Thanks, Judy. So building on the success of the uh, regional summit, uh, the five municipalities formalized their, their relationship with the P4G foundational documents. And those documents included a number of key aspects, including the hiring of, of a consultant and a project manager to kind of start moving the project forward. Um, we also gave the province the opportunity to participate with us. Um, but it is important to note that, in fact, the five municipalities actually have been funding this project on our own. Um, we also uh, started a communication and engagement strategy and developed the terms of reference uh, for the committee. The Regional Oversight Committee uh, is known as ROC. We're very good with our acronyms. There's many and it confuses me greatly, but the ROC is um, the Regional Oversight Committee which includes three elected officials from each municipality uh, and it's the main decision-making body uh, providing direction for the P4G regional plan. Uh, municipal endorsements still require the approval of all uh, five councils. And the, the general purpose of the ROC group is just to make the decision-making process go a little more smoothly. Um, it's, and its uh, goal is, of course, consensus. Uh, the Planning and Administration Committee, also known as the PAC Committee, uh, is where all our great administrative staff work together and develop the policies and the bylaws and, and bring those um, points of uh, direction forward. So just a few quick facts here on the P4G. So, this is sort of the, the big map, and it shows the regional plan that was agreed on early on in the process. The study boundaries are outlined in gray. Uh, in the beginning, we agreed that it, the intent of the regional plan was to look at a regional population of one million people. Uh, our current regional population is about 315,000, and so this growth will take a number of years to, to reach. And it's important to note that we used a population number rather than a growth rate, as growth rates can change. Um, the map also includes the various uh, First Nation land holdings and the municipalities involved. So our planning and consulting firm, O2, uh, knew that there were five municipalities who may have different perspectives starting. So to create a regional plan, we needed to start off by agreeing on a vision and a set of guiding principles. So we used a principle-based approach to develop the regional plan rather than a, than a position-based approach. In other words, we came to the table um, with the we rather than the I want. 
By using these principles as a guide, we were able to develop the regional plan. When we got stuck as we worked through the process, we just had to go back and ask why we're actually here. Open houses. Um, throughout the projects, we've had numerous open houses with landowners, stakeholders, rights holders. Um, I know from an urban's perspective, the engagement wasn't always immediate. Um, I know from Judy's perspective, that was the a big piece. They had a number of residents would come out, a number of landowners would come out, and they would sort of be the, the bearer of all, all that engagement, I guess. Um, some of the concern we heard through the project, so many people like the idea of taking a long-term approach and having the five municipalities work together. Um, others thought that, you know, 60 to 70 years or however long it might take to get to a million people was far too long. Um, some people felt that the areas proposed to set aside for environmental features and drainage, they aren't large enough or they were too large. Um, some landowners were concerned with that the urbans were freezing the land and there would be no interim development in the RM. And so in developing the regional plan, you can see that we needed to consider various perspectives and find a balance that at the end of the day would meet the needs of the region. Um, so after three years of work, and after listening to the feedback and working with our partners, on June 1st, 2017, we publicly released the draft regional plan as well as a servicing strategy and governments, governance and implementation strategy. Um, and you can find these documents online. Uh, the policies of the regional plan were developed based on the existing Corming Park, Saskatoon Planning District, which Judy already spoke to. Um, and it was felt that these existing policies within the district provided a great, way, a great place to start. Um, the servicing strategy provides high-level regional guidance on how to approach a number of servicing-related topics, including water, wastewater, drainage, and infrastructure corridors. Servicing is a critical component to consider because of the costs making poor choices now uh, have huge implications further on. A government's governance and implementation strategy was also drafted to provide guidance to the municipalities on how to make all of this work going forward. For example, the strategy provides a recommended work plan and timeline for future studies for the P4G to consider as we develop our municipal business plans and budgets. So the map on the screen shows our P4G future land use map and this was I guess the big success of the project early on was that we actually had a map that showed sort of what this urban municipality of a million people might look like and where development could happen. So the light green areas show long-term rural agricultural areas, and you can see they're kind of on the outside there. Um, the darker green is the green network study, which recognizes areas that may have drainage or environmental considerations. Uh, the light purple areas depict rural commercial and rural industrial areas. The light yellow areas show rural country residential areas. And then the dark yellow and the dark purple depict future urban areas, residential and commercial industrial. An important point to note is that we recognize that some of the urban areas may not be developed for decades and it's not appropriate to simply sterilize the land until the urbans um, grow out there. Because of this, we are currently developing policies that can allow for interim rural growth in the areas that are future urban growth. However, these interim uses cannot jeopardize the ability for urban municipalities to grow out or to take over these areas in the future. Develop in, development in these areas um, is the crux of our discussions today and what those interim developments will actually look like. So what's next for us? Well, as part of the P4G regional plan and new planning district, um, this expanded district will include uh, expanded boundaries as well as an expanded 13 member district planning commission. So the original Saskatoon RM planning district will expand to include this P4G area, and then the communities of Martinsville, Warman, and Osler will, will then join. Currently there are nine members, so it'll move to 13. In order to create the new planning district, a new P4G uh, official community plan and a P4G zoning bylaw must be drafted and given approval, and this is expected to happen this year. Uh, after P4G is approved, we're looking to a commercial industrial market study a number of regional servicing plans such as wastewater and potable water, uh, longer term studies uh, including wetlands, natural heritage resource inventory and a regional transportation strategy. We also under want to undertake future further conceptual plan work 
As I noted earlier, there is immense pressure for interim development in rural areas before urban growth gets there. Concept plans would look at how rural development could be serviced in the short term and then transitioned over time into an urban servicing system. This would also include making sure the road layouts, right-of-ways, or utility connections are placed in a way that could allow for re-subdivision of lots or expansion of roadways in the future. This would also take into account necessary costs for current or future service connections and levies. Um, we've budgeted to begin this more detailed planning and engineering work in 2019 for an important growth corridor between four of the five municipalities. So even though we're in, still in the process of creating a new planning district, there are still a number of pressing issues facing the region, especially as it relates to drainage. This image highlights the regional significance of drainage issues. We have many wetlands providing ecological and natural habitats and drainage corridors in our region. But pressures for growth, which you can see urban development on the edge of the swale. Because of these drainage challenges, P4G collectively pooled their resources to complete a regional drainage map to identify existing drainage issues for catchment areas around Warman and Martinsville, moving towards the river. The mapping was completed this winter and will be used to form, inform future drainage work, such as the location and size of culverts and appropriate size of storm ponds in site design. Building off this study, we may look to complete a regional drainage project to, see, to ease the drainage pressures in the region. Continuing to deliver these small wins for P4G has allowed us to keep the momentum throughout the project. It also highlights the importance of working together. So benefits and challenges. Um, a big benefit, of course, is the predictable plans for both urban and rural moving forward. Commu communication and understanding where we might have competing interests. Mutual planning provides for greater certainty for investors. Um, and another benefit, of course, is the regional efficiency for servicing water, sanitary, sewer, drainage, and roadways. Uh, of course, there are many challenges. Strong economies can result in challenges such as increasing development pressure in areas where it wasn't planned for, and there can be competing um, demands between municipalities for growth and increasing demands on infrastructure. Municipalities are not always politically ready to plan together. We're used to making decisions independently and to plan for the good of the region means we may need to surrender some of that autonomy. So funding is another, another big challenge, of course. Uh, regional infrastructure is very expensive. Fair and equitable distribution of costs means different things to different parties. Legislative tools. Provincial legislation addresses district planning, but it doesn't address regional planning in the ways the municipalities necessarily envisioned at the start, and it doesn't provide easy mechanisms for funding both direct and indirect services on a regional scale. So what advice do we have for all of you? Focus on principles, not positions. Remember, we developed six principles to go back to when negotiating got challenging. Uh, capitalize on the small wins, celebrate the small wins, find ways to build momentum. Always have the right people at the table to give strategic direction and be champions of your project. Create regular check-ins to ensure you're on the right track and keep up to date, which is a challenge in a large group, but it's important. Invite feedback into the process and be willing to sit, listen, and learn to those who have something to share. Build local support for change. Negotiations and key, if you're only coming to the table to get your way, it's a waste of time. We appreciate the opportunity to come to speak to all of you. Um, you can check out our website there, partnershipforgrowth.ca, for more information. Um, and of course, the question and answer we look forward to at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Mayor Mensch uh, and uh, Reeve Harwood for kicking it off. I am uh, Dennis Helmuth, and I am the uh, mayor for the town of Rostron, and it's my privilege to uh, talk about this issue with you. And I'd like to, first of all, say thanks to SUMA employee Sean McKenzie for doing a lot of the groundwork uh, putting this together. Um, I understand he's a ridiculously crazy person on our behalf. And so if you see Sean, uh, give him, or any SUMA employee, give them a good pat on the back. Uh, the amount of details necessary to put these kinds of things into place is uh, 
must seem at points in time to be almost unsurmountable, but here we are. So uh, thanks to, to Suma, and uh, thank you to everybody who came to this presentation. And uh, my intent is to uh, speak to regional cooperation from a slightly different perspective, that being from a, a fairly small town, but fairly, may I say, important town. I'm, I also see uh, a couple people in our Twin Rivers region sitting in the audience, and I can feel the glare of their eyes, because I know that when, uh, when or should I go off, off topic, they'll reel me in, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, I, I, I have been on council, as mentioned by uh, Councillor Hill, for a few years. Once upon a time, I was the kid on the kid around the table, and uh, now I have my phone here for one reason. I'm about to become a grandfather again, so that's what happens in the course of uh, <laughs> 20 plus years. Um, it, it is exciting to see a number of younger people here, so watch out uh, if you get to love municipal politics and if you really care about your community, you have the opportunity to be around the table for a long time. So uh, I'll just proceed with a few comments here and try to get to the topic. Um, Rostron, as many of you know, is about just 45 minutes north of Saskatoon. Um, we are a community of approximately 1,800 people, and uh, we are uh, probably a, a significant, uh, most significant service community for our region. Um, that being said, um, <clears throat> we have great relationships with and great friendships with communities in our area and I'll try to speak a little bit how that came into place and what kind of projects we are uh, looking at. Just as a little bit of a footnote driving in, uh, just a bit of an indicator and this sort of tags on to the comments earlier about growth in our, in our region and perhaps our extended region. But I noticed uh, we have two crazy large construction projects in our town. As many of you have, uh, maybe recall, this summer we had the tragedy of our uh, surface uh, John Deere equipment plant burn on us, which was a rather shocking event given that the building was only uh, 12, 10, 12 years old. Nonetheless, fire took hold and now just a few months later, or in the, in, in, here we are in December and cold January, February now, construction is well on the way in, and I tell you that that crazy building is, uh, is it's huge. It's, it's very impressive. And the second project where they're, they're busy working this morning is our new school. Uh, we're developing, with, we are developing, we are pleased to be the recipients of a new school and that will replace our elementary and our secondary high school uh, to be open September 2020. So these are, I think, our indicators of what's happening in our town but beyond that within our region. Uh, things are, are developing. So while this presentation is about the advantages of being part of a region, I want to say that first and foremost, my responsibility as, is, as to be, is to be the mayor of my town. I kind of like my neighbors. I like my town a whole lot more. <coughs> this is stating the obvious. And to this end, myself, my council, along with our administration, have our primary duty, our collective responsibility, to be proactive on behalf of our town and its inevitable growth in the next few years. To this end, we have to utilize all the tools available to make our town stable, well-serviced, prosperous, attractive. One tool, as we have heard already, is to gain advantage by acting regionally. Regional cooperation can be a daunting task. It takes a lot of conversation, many meetings, more than one false start, refocusing, encouragements, honesty and trust building, all the while keeping an eye on the prize. The hometown advantage, the theme for this year's Zuma convention then, is to include collaboration, cooperation, working together. In fact, not to cooperate will put my town at a disadvantage. I have seen that towns in RMs that do not share the challenges and the opportunities together are at a significant disadvantage. Maybe now more than ever, non-cooperation with neighbors will contribute to municipalities' demise. 
As mayor and an active participant in the Twin Rivers region, here are a few concepts I go to for inspiration when looking at working together on a problem or a project. I'd like to share them with you. And this is a bit of a divergence from uh, strict how-to, but more perhaps of a, a conceptual kind of an idea, or a few ideas I'd like to run by you. So, uh, some of you know I, I love my bicycle. So here we are, pre-organization. Um, there's possibilities, we see what can be, but as it stands now, it's a bit of a mess. The unified whole is different from the sum of the parts. Kind of, we, we know that. And somebody pretty smart said that several thousand years ago. We see that in our families. We see that when we go to hear music performed at a symphony orchestra, perhaps right here, or when we go to listen to one of our bands, and later today, we'll see that in the shape of a, of a team playing a certain sport. Perhaps we see that at our council tables. M maybe. At best, I think we do. The question then, is it possible that municipalities working together can be greater than the sum of the parts? I had the privilege uh, earlier last year, not that long ago, to visit this city. Uh, some of you will know which city it is, that being London, England. And talk about the whole being greater than the sum of the parts. It was simply staggering for me, coming from small town Saskatchewan, to get to a place like this and to see the intricacy of it and see the complexity of it from above. And while there's problems galore, as we know, in any municipality, nonetheless, the growth present was astounding. Just as a, a little footnote, counting from a one vantage point, you could easily count close to 100 different cranes putting up new, new development. So while problems abound in jolly old England, uh, nonetheless, it's simply staggering to see the complexity and to see what develops when no less than 9 million people have to work together. I don't know, it's, it was pretty exciting. So, first of all then, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Secondly, and this is quite straightforward, what benefits my town will benefit other communities and beyond, and vice versa. There is no need for envy. A new business in your town, as a non-resident, I suspect they will be more than delighted to have my business or my town's business. Certainly, it's, we like to purchase locally, but hey, purchasing regionally benefits everybody. The third point that I'm really intrigued with is something called scalability. And here, I don't have any neat little uh, slides or anything, but I'll simply reference an author. His name is Jeffrey West. And the name of the book is simply Scale, S-C-A-L-E, Scale. It has a rather complex uh, subtitle, which I won't trouble you with. And just a few comments on, on what, what he speaks about. So Jeffrey West is actually a physicist. And he's become intrigued with how things, how all kinds of things scale. How do they develop and grow in size? Is there a predictability or a proportional development as a tree grows? or as an infant grows into an adult. We all know from observations and from an intuitive level, there is predictability. In the case of communities of people, towns and cities, regions, what happens, Jeffrey West asks, as they grow and their population increases? Are there consistencies here too? His observations are impressive. He and his team have observed that when a city or a region doubles in size, everything increases consistently by 15%. Wages, creativity, health outcomes, good ideas, patents, crime, educational institutions, solid waste. Everything increases by 15%. It's an amazing observation that he has written about and he, that he talks about. There is consistent growth observable. 
Growth tra trajectories are consistent and efficiency rates are as well. No matter what population group studied, it turns out they become more efficient as they increase in size. So for example, when a population doubles, it does not need a doubling of energy. It only needs an increase of 75% of energy to keep a population functioning once it has doubled. Isn't that amazing? You double the population, you only need a 75% increase in energy to keep that population warm, etc. As West has observed consistently around the world, as a population doubles, there will be approximately a 15% decrease in infrastructure cost. That's pretty exciting. 15% decrease in infrastructure cost when a population doubles. So for my town and with my regional neighbors, with this motivation in place and based on my town's actual experience, I can get behind strategic and thoughtful growth knowing that with it, efficiencies follow. Back here on Earth, Twin Rivers, who are we? We represent approximately 10,000 citizens. Uh, we have we represent approximately 2,731 square kilometers. We were, myself and, uh, and, and Chief Roy, to, be, to, be, who's, to speak next, were recently, well, about a year ago, we had the pr privilege of presenting in Ottawa and I ran that little stat by them, and it was, it was fun catching their reaction. But uh, it's a large area, uh, about 10,000 people. We're just north of uh, the community referenced earlier, Osler, and we extend up the number 11 highway to approximately uh, McDowell, or a little, a little bit further north than that even. We uh, consist of three, uh, six urban municipalities, three RMs, and of course, Beards and Oka Mesa's First Nation. And there we go. So those are the communities that Twin Rivers has participation from. And I'll say more or less, because there's always going to be uh, variance in interest, in, in uh, believing, perhaps. But for the most part, uh, or th this is a, the definitive list as it stands now. Okay, next. Here are some of our regional projects. We meet every month for conversations and meetings with my fellow mayors, uh, Reeves, councillors, and, uh, and most often CEOs as well with our various municipalities. We do employ a part-time CAO uh, at this point, 30 hours a month, who helps us get our, our meetings together, uh, do some, a bit of research for us, puts out minutes, all of, the, all of those uh, technical kinds of things. We do have uh, emergency response vehicle and equipment sharing. We participate, or we have talked a lot about solid waste management, and we continue to talk about that. It seems as on that topic, it's often one step forward, two steps back. It's a very complex uh, uh, conversation, and, and Chief Roy will uh, reference this again going forward. We have developed a uh, conversation and friendship with a friendship agreement with Beardies and Oka Mesa's Cree Nation, and that's something that is not quite, uh, that project is definitely ongoing, as are all good projects. It's, it's, uh, it takes a long time, but I'm, it's really also very exciting to be working on a project that's not exactly uh, infrastructure, but it's very, very uh, encouraging and, and obviously it's very important. Uh, there's a couple more here, a couple big ones actually. We participate together in physical uh, physician recruitment and retention incentives. We are actively, as a region, uh, advocating for a hospital replacement in the town of Rostron, and this involves uh, advocating to our ministers, who uh, so as soon as we see them walking around here, we'll give them a good wink. Uh, we are currently in the midst of some pretty heavy-duty fundraising, and all all the region, all of the communities within our region are participating in terms of levying their citizens. The the, the general uh, formula is that a, a region needs to come up with 20% of the capital costs. So to this end, we're looking at having to raise 
we're guessing around seven million dollars to make our 20 percent and we're at currently around three million so we're waiting but we're strongly uh, working on that project uh, we share expenses for medical employees temporary housing uh, we share a planning consultant. We are an official district planning commission and we have a development appeals board. We share a bylaw, a bylaw enforcement officer and equipment expenses and we participate collectively in an annual household hazardous waste collection uh, program. So, uh, those are a few projects that are underway. Uh, some of them are further ahead than others and when we look down the road, there's no shortage in new, of new projects that we could be grabbing a hold of. As I've observed then, the fall, I've observed that with a lot of hard work, the prize and benefits of regional cooperation come into focus. There are financial advantages and savings. There are better use of limited resources. We can minimize redundancies in services, facilities, or equipment. Just as one quick example, about 10, 12 years ago, our town built a new swimming pool. And uh, at the time, of course, uh, the price point seemed outrageous. If we were to do it now again, we would perhaps be shocked even further. Nonetheless, we proceeded to build the pool. And we've kept really careful statistics on who uses that pool. and. Uh, Surprise, surprise, and it's a good thing. The usage goes way beyond our town. And I think with, uh, in cooperation, in conversation with our municipal partners, were we to have that pool replaced again, or perhaps where, if another town is to replace an arena, you'd have to really, really think seriously and, and move toward doing it together. The, given the usage pattern in our, in our, in our, our swimming pool, had we have had regional participation 10 years ago, it would probably be an even more impressive facility. So, just as a case, case in point. We can identify and develop projects of regional importance. And for us, of course, one of the main projects is the replacement of our hospital. We can learn best practices from our closest neighbors. And sometimes we can learn from each other's mistakes. We can build trust, transparency, and collegiality. I know those are warm, fuzzy words, but they are really, really important when you start talking to your, your neighbors who once upon a time, uh, you might put up with them seeing them at a hockey game, but really, we have to move forward and uh, dig in together. In the end, our ratepayers and everyone living in our region will benefit. Community and important economic development should advance more efficiently and effectively. Is regional co collaboration and growing together crucial? And on a bit of a cheeky note here, join or die. This is uh, obviously a state, state side uh, image. We can strike out those words and put in our own to make it relevant. But I really think this kind of states it in a rather uh, cheeky way, but uh, Collaboration is not a choice. You have to build, you have to join up, and uh, you'll, move, you'll move forward. Uh, I, I w did mention that one of the things we work on is uh, building friendship with our neighbors to the north, and at this point I'd like to pass it over to uh, a gentleman I've known for quite a few years, and we continue to get together and commiserate over our official duties and uh, we uh, encourage each other so I'd like to pass it over to Chief Roy Petit from Beardies and Oka Mesas and he will talk a little bit more about collaboration with with uh, collaboration and the importance of it. Thank, thank you. Good morning everybody or afternoon now I guess. I didn't uh, prepare anything so you'll just have to look at me. Uh, thanks, Suma, for the invitation. I didn't know what I was going to be able to offer to, uh, to the group here or part of this panel, but um, it, thinking about it uh, the past couple of days and preparing mentally to come and stand up here and speak to all of you, 
I just thought about the, the partnership that we've created between Twin Rivers and ourselves. It wasn't something that uh, we chose to do. It was something that came about through the uh, Federation of Canadian Municipalities. I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to say that. FCM brought us together. We did an application to them. Uh, actually, a former employer, uh, employee of the band did an application and brought us all together. So most of the people in Twin Rivers and ourselves got together in, in a room. We sat down. Uh, we had some very open and frank discussions about who we were and shared our history and uh, kind of what our plans were. And that was the, the beginning point of what uh, brought me to uh, the Twin Rivers and sitting uh, as part of the, the board or the committee. Or what do you call yourselves? Or ourselves, I guess. But uh, yeah, it was interesting to, to be a part of. Uh, there's, there's a lot of misconceptions about First Nations and how we operate and how we're funded. Uh, we do not have a load of money. We do pay taxes. I'm a homeowner in Duck Lake and I actually been paying taxes all my life working off the community. The only people who don't pay tax is if you're working on the community. And uh, we pay taxes everywhere we go. So we're part of the whole and, and it's um, unfortunate, but decades and decades of media coverage that uh, states otherwise is what's created this separation. And so we're trying to build that bridge and the friendship agreement came from all of that. It's, uh, it was recommended by FCM, the people who facilitated our groups. We met about uh, three or four times, I think, in the two years planning on uh, what we could do together as, as uh, close muni municipalities. Between the Twin Rivers, uh, between the two rivers there, we're, we're very closely situated, right? But there were not a lot of people. Um, but the, the one thing that did start off was the, uh, the solid waste management, um, discussing that and how we can work together to kind of create one place where we can all go to cut down costs and, and not uh, disturb the land much more than we already have. It was interesting to learn through uh, the studies that were done that there's a northern state that uh, has about the same population as us and they only have four dump sites in their area and we have over 300 in Saskatchewan. So environmentally, it just makes sense for, for us to come together and try to fix all that. So thinking uh, environmental-wise, we're, we're trying to get along and uh, work at creating those spaces, but as you saw, we're 10,000 people in our area and just not quite enough to, to make that happen, and unfortunately. Um, and the other thing is we're all, we all receive our funding differently. We've all got... Uh, all kinds of things going on in our, in our own community, so it's hard to get together. The one thing we did and would recommend is having some sort of a project manager if, we're, if you're going to try and get into something like that, economic development or solid waste management or whatever it is that you choose to do. Um, I'm not going to get into a whole lot of about who uh, Beardies and Okimasis is. If, uh, we have a web page, and you can take a look at it. There's some, some history on there and some uh, background on some of the people who work there. I, uh, I, I didn't come into uh, politics. Uh, I didn't ever see myself being a chief of my community. I didn't call on this position. My late mother, who passed away two years ago before she died, told my auntie that I had to run for chief, so mom said, so I did. <laughs> And I, I was lucky to get in. I've, I've only run the previous term as a councillor for three years, and so I'm in my second year as chief. But uh, like Dennis, I love my community. I love the families who are there. We're, we're uh, most of us related, and, and my heart is um, with the future, environmental-wise. And... Um, I go and attend our elementary school's graduation every year for the kindergartens and I see all those little kids in their little hats and tassels and gowns and 
you know, I think there's our future. There's, there's the people who are going to be here uh, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, sitting in this position that I'm in, and what am I going to leave for them? And that's how I, I lead my community. That's how I try and help my community. So any way that I can partner with people who are close to us or even people who are not close to us, I want to try and do that. I want to try and build those bridges because we have to work together. If you live in Saskatchewan, you've seen the weather and the changes that are happening. And we went from flooding to uh, droughts. And there's uh, we did a, a study, not us, but uh, the uh, university did a study on the on the environment for our area, and they're looking at weather conditions in uh, 20 years, minus four in the summer, plus four in the winter, kind of averages, and it's scary to uh, to know what's coming environmental-wise. There there is climate change is happening, and we need to do something for those kids because if uh, we're not going to do it then they're, they're lost. Then that's where, that's why I'm here in this position. And, and it's different for being a chief because on, I noticed when I first started in my first month there, I was on the phone talking about this uh, partnership. We're trying to get into the wind, wind uh, power. And that's probably about $10 million project and, and uh, it's got off the phone. Next phone call was, hey, there's dogs running loose in the village. Can you come and get them? So the, the range of what I have to deal with on a daily basis is huge because it's not just infrastructure and planning. It's, it's education. It's social development. Everything that uh, the country looks after is, is that's what I see myself as, is looking after this little tiny country inside of the country. And it's very busy. There's not a lot of money. The, the funding that we do receive, it's all spoken for and it goes directly to where it's supposed to go to. And then our land's income goes to cover the shortfalls in that. We're trying to start economic development partnerships. The wind power is one. And uh, we have a partnership at BHP as for the catering and housekeeping. So there's all these little pockets of money that would come in and kind of helps us set off costs. Um, when there's infrastructure issues, we have to apply for dollars through federation or through um, ANSI. And just to let you know how that works, it's usually you make the application. They say, "Okay, do a study. We'll see what you need." So we do a study, and they say, "Okay, we'll we'll go ahead and do it, or we won't do it, depending on that study." So when I started in 2014, the flooding was already underway from 2007. Our roads were being washed out, and uh, so we applied. They said, do the study, get the professionals, engineers, and everybody out. Got them out. They came and did it. It was going to be $6 million for them to come and upgrade the roads, prepare them, or fix those areas anyways that were, were starting to flood. Uh, the person who was looking after that file moved to Alberta, left the file on the desk, never got looked at. So when I started, it was... Uh, we need to do another study. So at the end of that study was $10 million. They couldn't do anything that year, so they said do another study next year. So by the end of three years, it was uh, $12 million that the roads ended up being uh, costing. But we didn't have the money, they didn't have the money, so the roads never got done. So we're sitting with uh, a whole section of road that's washed out in a couple other places. So the, there's no extra dollars that we have, the only business we have is a gas station and that's it's an awesome place on on the highway 11 which is the third busiest highway in saskatchewan and uh, but it's small and it doesn't make a huge amount of money and it doesn't offset our costs so we're always looking at ways of partnering that way as well and dennis and i get together often and talk about possibilities and uh, it's nice to talk about it but then getting it done is another story and We'll figure that out as we go along. Don't expect anything magical to happen because you start talking. It's it's actually uh, the the uh, thing we went to in Ottawa when we did presentations over there. It was nice to see all of the different partnerships that are happening and existing all across Canada between First Nations and the municipalities and towns. 
starting to work together and um, I'm hopeful for Saskatchewan that we continue building on those kinds of bridges and you know, thanks for the invitation and I hope I added a little bit to whatever you came here for. I am. So I'm just going to impose for a moment. Um, could I ask the, uh, anyone that's a member of the P4G or ROC just to stand and be recognized in case anyone in the audience would like to catch up with you later for questions. I know you're in here. Please stand up and be recognized. Good. Thank you very much. So if you've got questions, you can go to them. Thanks, Dan. No problem. Well, thank you, uh, panelists. And Chief, thank you for your taxes in Saskatoon. And please do get a parking ticket or two as well. That would help us out a little bit. <laughs> We will now take questions for any of the panelists that are up here, and I will ask you to come to the mic in the center aisle here, and feel free to queue up behind the person that's in front of you, and then we can get through more questions. Come on down, don't be shy. And I just ask you to please introduce yourself with your name and the municipality that you're from. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, Jonathan Torson from the city of Lloydminster. Um, I just have a question as far as how do you deal with interim growth in the P4G model because uh, I'm just curious in terms of the service level or the standard that things are developed at whether it's urban or rural as they come in so that you can still have growth as you're working on things um, prior to any kind of future annexation to deal with the future plans of expansion. This is on. Uh, this is why I don't sleep at night, and this is why I'm going gray, because that's the biggest issue, certainly that in the RM that we're that we deal with, is because certainly the folks in our RM still want to be able to develop, but we want to recognize the issue that the urbans will eventually get into those areas that are designated for future growth for the urban. So it, this is probably the biggest issue right now around the table, um, and and as I've said around the table, that anytime any of the urbans grow unless they go up, they're going to go out. And when they go out, they'll go into the RM. So we are working hard to, to come up with a solution that um, there is interim growth in the meantime in such a manner that if and when the urbans get to those areas that we will not impede growth. So it's, it's, it's tricky, but um, I've also said that if it takes 80 years to get somewhere, that's a long time. I'm not convinced that's interim. I think that's a lifetime. So we have some issues. Just, just follow up question, go ahead. Jonathan Torson, City of Lloydminster again. Uh, so then, just uh, with that, so is there within your plan a model to deal with any of those, or are they dealt with on development by development? Uh, so do you come up with an agreement on the individual developments as they come? Um, great question. I think we're, we're sort of working through that right now. Um, and keeping in mind that we have got three, three urbans beside the city of Saskatoon that the RM has to deal with. So I think we are hoping that around the table we can work and trust, that's the big word, trust, that if something comes forward that we feel is a win-win. Somebody did make a comment that, um, you know, any development is good. And the old saying, you know, all ships rise with the tide, I believe is true. So if Ozer does well, we all do well. So we're hoping that when different um, developments come forward, we can agree in some manner to move it forward, but some of the issues of future servicing are on the table. Um, so I'm going to pass this to, to the mayor beside me because this is something that you're going to have two perspectives here. For sure. Um, thanks. Yeah, I think that's actually the crux of where we're, we're currently at in our official community plan. So um, the administration and planners who are far smarter than I am, um, they're working feverishly in the background to get bylaws and policies in place so that when uh, development comes forward, we can have a look at it and, and see if it fits. And if it's, there's a various criteria for each of those things that are gonna be laid out in the OCP, what does an interim use look like? Um, when land needs to be subdivided, is that an interim use? Like at what point does it become a rural use versus an urban use? Um, there's many questions, uh, including jurisdiction. Like does urban mean a city or a town or does it mean just a standard of development? Um, you talk about doing developments and, and leapfrogging. Um, how does that happen? How, does, how do you have a development in place that doesn't have um, water and wastewater, but then you know, in that, that area of land doesn't want that urban connection, but the land further down the road does, and who pays for those things? Um, so all those are kind of 
in the works, I guess. Mm -hmm. In the end, we hope to have that. I know we're looking now at like specific examples in our workshops that are going to be coming forward. Like, how would we handle the exact question you're asking? So we have, you name it, like, okay, now how does it work out in our OCP? How will, how will we address that in terms of the servicing costs? Are you dealing with that right now? Is that why you're smiling? Tough, tough to say for sure. <laughs> Don't uh, be shy. We will a, a little Lloyd Minster off the mic if somebody else wants to. Well, no, I, <laughs> I will uh, move as soon as someone else is coming up to ask questions. But Jonathan Torsten from City of Lloyd Minster. Uh, this is a more general question. Um, in terms of having everyone on side in terms of your council, because you run into the scenario where there maybe is a little more protectionism that could come from your council. How did you find dealing with maybe relationships on your council in general? Because some may be a little more open-minded to the idea of, of uh, sharing and regional growth and those things, but some may be a little more, more for me means less for you type of ideals. Well, I think um, Chief actually spoke to it earlier, uh, my, I don't know exactly where it was, but you mentioned the friendship agreement. And it's really just about, and, and Reeve spoke to it too, about trust. It's just, it's actually relationships. It's the first part. You have to get in the room and talk and be comfortable that, you know, we're actually, we're actually in it together. You're not just saying that, that you want, you want something better for the region. And I think when you get to that place um, where there is that trust, um, then at least the group that's there, in our case, the P4G group, um, we can have those conversations. Back at the council table, for those that aren't involved in the conversations, um, then I would agree, like, it, it, there is more diversity in the opinion, but it's because they don't, they don't know. They, they aren't part of those conversations. They kind of are still the old way of, well, we play them in hockey and I don't really like them. <laughs> and, and so it's, <laughs> it's, it's harder, for sure, but I think that's the first piece, is the relationship piece, and then, the, the little wins, like I know a big one for, for Martinsville um, was actually when the RM brought a, a proposal to change the, one of the land uses um, kind of by the landfill site from what it was, what, it, what color it was in the map and they needed to switch it. And, and we were interested in that process, like how that would work out because I think in our work we've seen some areas where maybe, you know, those, those might have to change for Martinsville as well. And it, I think it was amicable, I think it was, wow. it was you do that. You're too strong. Uh, well, I'm not going to say it's easy around the council table because I, I, I always say I'm hurting cats with my council. But um, because there is that feeling of protectionism, I'm not going to say there's not. Uh, because as I said earlier, when the development happens, it goes into the RM. It's, it's taking, taking our land. But I think um, uh, Mayor Munch is saying the right thing. I think we have to build a trust. And the old saying about driving the bus or being a passenger, well, we want to be able to be part of the, the, the group that's starting to drive that bus and making decisions that are long range. Uh, it's a little painful. I'm, I'm going to admit that. Um, but at the same time, we've come a long ways from when we started probably four or five years ago. I, I think it's, it's been a, a long process that there have been a few bumps. And, um, but I think council are... The RM Council right now is certainly more open to, to uh, how we're moving forward. And being honest, if you get someone from Calgary call and want to develop in the RM, it's kind of handy to have a map where you can look at that map and say, this is the area you've got to look at if you want to do something. We've got a long ways to go, but I'm very confident that we're going in the right direction. Yeah, and I would uh, just add to uh, some of these comments, and, and I agree that uh, trust is crucial. I, I'm in a, in a fortunate position. My, my council along with our administration, are, are very much on the same page in terms of embracing a regional uh, approach. I don't think it's... Uh, that's not always the case in all of our neighbors' councils. And, and these things ebb and flow. Put in a new council, put in a new, uh, a new reeve or a new mayor, and uh, change the administration around. And things will become wobbly, perhaps, and perhaps even a little bit off the rails at times. So there's really, really an important uh, role to be paid, played by, uh, by mayors, if I may say, and councillors, to, to keep the focus. And, and one way to do that is to have really, really capable, well-paid administration. <laughs> I know that that sounds like... Uh, well, no, I don't apologize for saying it for a moment. They, good, solid administrators, they are our collective memory. 
and they will help move forward the project, if you will. And uh, there will be stops and starts, there will be buy-ins and buy-outs, and there will be what's in it for me kind of thinking. But um, I think we always have to keep the door open when those, when those opportunities seem to fall away. And um, with time and, and with solid evidence, we, we can demonstrate to reluctant uh, government people that there is efficiencies to be had. Really, really quickly, uh, and as Chief, Chief Roy mentioned, when, when we do identify projects that will result in being more efficient and to be more cost beneficial, those projects require a lot of work. They require a lot of uh, feet on the ground. And one of my things, and maybe one of my, one of my pitches is that our friends at, at the provincial level really, I think, could benefit by giving us assistance in this area to literally help pay for some administrative, administrative heft to move projects forward. Um, it, the benefits I'm, will, will trickle down or trickle up. I, I'm, I'm convinced of that. Chief Roy, did you want to add anything to the question? Okay. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, my name is uh, Hugh Watt, uh, Deputy Mayor of the LaRange. Um, I don't really have a question per se, but more of a comment to extend on this whole regional initiative. In the uh, LaRange area, um, we, we work with a very progressive band, Black LaRange Indian Band. Uh, we've got a smaller uh, village to the south of Air Range, but also we've got a huge surrounding area, which would entail uh, northern municipal affairs and some of the recreational communities. And it's very important for the province of Saskatchewan, don't be shy. Talk with your, uh, your, your First Nations people and the surrounding communities because the cost measures are for your waste, solid waste management here. We're, we're in negotiation right now and very close to building a, a multi-million dollar um, uh, landfill facility. We couldn't do that. Laurence couldn't do that. Air Ranch couldn't do it. But as the, th and Lac Laurence Indian Band, but as three parties, mm -hmm. these, these projects can be finished. Mm -hmm. uh, we also share in our, our water. Why have three water plants? We've got one, we've got a regional water initiative, we've got regional waste. Now, we're gonna extend that further with this agreement. Again, get around these tables, start the conversations. It's very key also in your project management. Get key project management people at that table, along with your, your, your CAOs. As you can attest to, Mr. Mayor, your CAOs are busy enough also. So again, um, collaboratively work together. These projects can be done. Your governments, they haven't got the funding. Let's be honest. We can't continually run to the government for, for, for handouts. Work together. Pool those funds. Thank you for your time. Don't be shy. We've got another uh, 20 minutes still. Uh, Jim Glant, Mayor of Churchbridge. Uh, I've got a question for you. Uh, you mentioned that you do uh, regional hazardous, household hazardous waste. Yeah. Where do you send it? The company. I'm looking. <laughs> I'm looking way in the back there to one of my uh, one of our administrators. Uh, the company comes up from Saskatoon. Yeah. Is it? Envirotech. Okay. Is that Envirotech? And they're called uh, GFL now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, GM, yeah. So there is a, a there is, a, at, as far as I know, there's one collector, which is great if you're the collector. It's very pricey, but we simply collaborate with them and we contract with them. They come up and there's a rotation, so they circuit. They will come to the community that we designate, which is kind of really really handy for that community on that day of the year, but. Uh, on the other hand, it's not a big deal to load up your uh, hazardous waste and, and drive it to that community. And then the costs are proportioned out according to uh, the size of your community in the end. It is very expensive. We debated <laughs> what, what the alternatives are, but uh, at this point we'll just continue to go, th go through with it because it is an essential service, uh, we feel. So we can, I can, we can line you up with the the name of the company that that the, the only one that I'm aware of that that will come out and collect that stuff for you. 
I just have one more comment. Uh, I'm the, this is my third term as mayor. Uh, when I first became mayor, I started a, an area of, uh, same as you guys, and uh, we cooperate. We, at the start, it was terrible. We, I have six towns, two villages, and four RMs that used to hate each other, and now we meet four times a year. We just uh, signed up to do a, a whole region of rural crime watch. And I've got representatives from every one of those communities. So if you have the idea to start regional cooperation, go for it. And I hope that SUMA could take all these regions that are, are already developed and make a database. So if you have any questions, you could, you could find people that are regionally cooperating. Thank you. And it is on the to-do list. They're working on it, actually, as we, as we speak. So go ahead. Hi, I'm uh, Rod Perkins, Mayor of Kindersley. Just wanted to add a, a little bit uh, towards this regional cooperation. I think it was two months ago we opened our Western Regional Landfill. It's a consortium of 19 different municipal bodies that have uh, worked on this for, I guess, three to four years, uh, Kindersley being it's all represented by population and costed out by population, but I think the town of Kindersley had 50% and the other 18 municipal bodies, several villages, several RMs, all went together on this. Uh, we have a manager in Loris that runs it, and uh, I think it was a pretty good, it took a lot of work and it took some time to get it all built, but I think it the game plan that we have, it's good for the next 40 to 60 years. So it can work. It, it takes time and it takes patience. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Here comes Lloyd Minister again. <laughs> What's your name again, please? Uh, <laughs> Councillor Jonathan Torrison from City of Lloyd Minster. Uh, this is just a comment, piece of information, uh, maybe for something that uh, SUMA delegates want to consider for future years is something they'd like to advocate for, but uh, we have the benefit of also following Alberta regulations. So in Alberta, one of the things that they instituted in the last few years is an ICF, which is something that's mandatory between every adjacent municipality. An ICF stands for Intermunicipal Collaboration Framework. The only trouble is, is it mandates that you have to make a plan to work together and to find uh, cost efficiencies, how you're going to share resources, things like that. Uh, but it was mandated by the government. So there's a little bit of trickiness because if you don't exactly have the money, there is some funding for it, but you still have to put up the cash to do it. So anyway, it's something to maybe look into as far as, uh, you know, SUMA delegates as something for a resolution in future years or something like that uh, to maybe lobby the government to give some kind of funding for a similar framework. Thank you. Quick question. Are yeah. the, um, any of the grants or the revenue sharing from the provincial government in Alberta tied to the completion of that ICF? I believe so. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Oh, come on down. <laughs> Gary Filipchuk, uh, City of Warbin Councillor. Also been in part of the P4G right from the beginning. Just one point that I want to mention is, is finding that common foe. Some mentioned the garbage dump. The big one for us at the time was water. And it, we had flooding in the area, and now we have wastewater issues with capacity issues in Martinsville and Warman and, and area. So, so water for us in many ways, and even getting water from the city, the costs that were going up extreme amounts, just having us all at the table together just made it something that we want to find solutions together. So I guess... Just ask you a question, if they're uh, looking back on, is there anything you would do different? And I, I guess that could be for any of you. Just uh, you've had five, six years of it. I know we wanted some big to-dos, but also with the funding, I know uh, the deputy mayor from La Ronge mentioned that uh, we have to find our own money, but a lot of ways the provincial and federal money is going to be tied to these regional partnerships. So if you want that money for water, for wastewater, areas like that, then it really is working together. Because if you're out trying to get it on your own, you're probably not going to be approved. Councillor, just so you know, Saskatoon is prepared to take crap from Mormons, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> I can. Okay. Uh, 
I guess when I look back on it, because it seems like it's been a long time, is probably uh, would have suggested that we assign people specifically to, to for this project. Because the way it is right now, a lot of our municipalities have our staff that are kind of working off the side of their desk doing this project. So it's, uh, it's, it's taken a long time. Um, I'm not saying it would speed it up a whole bunch, but I think if we had dedicated people, it would have helped a whole bunch in the process. Um, you're nodding, so you might agree to. We'll see what this guy next to me thinks. Um, I guess the big thing that I've learned is just you, and, and SUMA represents this in its totality, but you are stronger together. Like you represent a large amount of people. And I know for the city of Martinsville, one of our things was wastewater. And we started on that journey in 2014. And we had a big partner. We had Saskatoon as a partner. And it wasn't actually until the P4G group got together that the province actually listened. So I think the, the biggest thing I would, I would recommend to people is that, you know, go to your neighbors and, and, and collectively use your voice um, to make changes because you can do it and they, they, they will listen. One, uh, one interesting um, observation that I came across thinking about this a little bit was um, it has been observed uh, that when a, gov when a governance of a municipality declines involvement with other, other neighbors, that's, that's a really red light. That indicates that that community is falling off. So just get together a couple times a year and at the start and just talk about uh, common issues, have coffee together and, and identify a project, uh, move, move it forward. But not to not to to talk with your neighbors, be it in a, on a formal level or be it on an informal level. It's it's a death knell to your community. Um, just a little bit curious to think of. It's curious to think about. I, I know that Suma doesn't represent every community. Not all communities are part of Suma. But wouldn't it be interesting to look at them and see how they're doing, or not? And that's kind of a negative example. But uh, there, there's tremendous. Uh, uh, Good to be had from uh, working working together and and working with through SUMA and other organizations. Um, I'd really really quickly mention that the 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 scope can increase and increase. We have uh, really good uh, connections with the city to the north of us, as we do to the city right here. But Prince Albert, our our keen administrator, has managed to be part of some uh, buying initiatives. I know that there's SUMA advantage, but there are other advantages to working with other communities. So SUMA, uh, pardon me, in collaboration with Prince Albert, uh, our administrator has found us some pretty, pretty nifty cost savings. Um, there's also another organization called Saskatoon North Communities Association, which includes uh, all of us here going more, uh, and, and the, the mayors of Warman, Martinsville, our, Corman Park, et cetera, et cetera. So another, it's yet another uh, umbrella group where we can get together and uh, plan for the better. Thanks. I think um, one of the things that I learned being a part of uh, Twin Rivers and the planning was uh, the cost saving. When you're doing any project, you you have to apply for dollars through federal, provincial, and try and get that project done. So you have to get a study, usually done by um, one of the agencies that are around. And if you're paying for that cost yourself, it's, uh, it takes a big chunk out of your funding. But if you work together, uh, the, the last study, like we did a study for our solid waste management. Twin Rivers did one, I think, about two years before that. And it was a big cost for, for everyone, but uh, then coming together and trying to put one for all of us, we had to do another study and combine those two, so that was another added cost, but it, it's a little easier on, on the, uh, the bank account if you can each put a piece of uh, the funding or some of your funding towards that. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Kate Kading, Councillor for the Town of Rostern. Um, I am very privileged to work with Dennis on almost a daily basis sometimes. Um, as he was saying, municipalities who meet maybe with a little bit of reticence on regional cooperation, don't write it off. So my question to the panelists is, if as a mayor, Reeve, councillor, you, you meet with some pushback, 
how often should you be poking the bear, so to speak? Um, maybe an easy answer is when there's turnover. But if there's no turnover, what would you suggest to municipalities trying to get this cooperation going when there's pushback? How often should you be seeking this out? And it, more of a basic answer to that. How do people get involved in that? Uh, thank you, Councillor. <laughs> Uh, really, really quickly, uh, yeah, it, it is really tempting to uh, stick a finger in the hornet's nest sometime and say, get with it or, or leave town. Uh, probably not the best approach. Uh, one, one practical thing we're doing is uh, we're, we're encouraging buy-in. So, for example, uh, uh, bylaw enforcement. Some communities say, uh, I don't have any trouble with, it, with our bylaws. Our, our, our citizens are exemplary and they never... Uh, they never uh, go. They never abuse our bylaws. Yeah, that's a little bit dicey. To uh, a bit of a dicey claim, but uh, so one one thing we do is say if if you don't buy in initially, there's there's another price point really, and so that should you want bylaw enforcement, and you're not part of our our uh, collective approach, the price point will be incrementally higher, unapologetically so. So. Um, that being said, probably more helpful to always have a carrot out there rather than a stick. As time goes on, as a, an elected official, one is tempted to be um, less than charitable at times, but nonetheless, uh, it, it behooves us to, uh, to keep the door open, even when we think it seems to be closing. Anyone want to add anything? No? All right. Any other questions from the floor? Come on down. Again, not a question for the panel, but uh, I did forget, I, I just wanted to thank uh, the Chief for, for being here today, but also uh, I'm a hockey guy and I was out at Beardy's last night and I watched a great win, so uh, keep up the good work on the hockey front too. And, and anybody, it's great entertainment. Thank you. No other questions for the panelists? Panelists, did you have anything you wanted to add for last words? Well, thanks for your attention. and. Uh, if, if you wish, uh, be, I'd be lo love to bump into any of you in the next couple of days for heated conversation. Can do no, no wrong on a cold day like this. Or for a warm pat on the back. That's welcome too, but thanks for your attention. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you can join me in thanking Chief Roy, Mayors Helmuth and Mench, and Reeve Hardwood, Harwood for their time here today and sharing their knowledge and wisdom and experience with us, please join me. So, thank you for being here today. You're going to be getting out of here about eight minutes early. Don't tell anybody. I seem to let you out early every year. I do one of these. They're not going to let me do them anymore. There's an hour break now. You guys get an hour and eight minutes for the trade show. And remember, this is the first year that there's actually booths down in the lower level as well, too. You know, it's backstage, up front. Go downstairs as well, too. There's a whole number of booths back there as well. So. I will remind you as well that the weather in Saskatoon was Councillor Donauer's responsibility this year, not mine. So enjoy convention. Thank you. Uh, 525. Yes. I, I have